Good morning and welcome to Chapel Baptist Church for our Sunday morning service. We thank you so much for tuning in to us by way of YouTube. We hope that you are doing well during this time that we're away from each other. We're looking forward to the time that we can come back together at this building and to be at the A couple of her requests, the Boots family is possibly closing on a house this week on Wednesday. So pray that everything goes well with that and everything works as smooth as possible. And secondly, we need to pray for Carlos's family. Carlos went to be with the Lord on Thursday. So pray for the family for comfort. Pray for anybody that isn't saved, that through this, that they will get saved. So let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service and let, let us pray for these prayer requests. Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time together. Please, Father, help Carlos's family. We ask you to be with them, meet their needs, help them to be comforted. You are the God of all comfort. We ask you to meet their needs. If there are any of his family members that have not come to Christ, may they understand their need, be convicted over their sin, and come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. We ask you to bless our service. We ask you to meet our needs where we're at. And please, Father, help us to seek you and to view you and adore you as wonderful. And may you be given all the praise and glory for what happens during this service. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter number 2. The book of Colossians, that's where our scripture reading will be today. Colossians chapter number 2. There are only four chapters in the book of Colossians. So you could say we're one-fourth of the way through. We finished chapter 1 last week. Book of Mea 1 through 7 of Colossians chapter number 2. Look with me, verse number 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord and ask Him to bless our message today. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. We know that this is Your Word indeed. And Father, may You help us to know You better. Help us to understand Your Word. Help us to know what You want us to do. And Father, may You give us power from on high to do. And help us to know You better more and more. Help us to fall more and more in love with You. Help us to obey You in Your Word in our lives, I do pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to ask you a question today, and uh, it's a very straightforward question. I just want you to ponder about. The question is, what are the signs of a healthy church? What are the signs of a healthy church? As you're pondering that question, I'm going to give you some signs that are not necessarily the signs of a healthy church, okay? The first one is that of a big congregation. Just because your church is great, just because your church is large, doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy church. It means that you know how to draw a crowd. Uh, Spurgeon said it very neatly. He said, if you want to draw a crowd, all you have to do is douse yourself with gasoline and light a match. That will surely grow a crowd. Uh, but then again, you think about it, it's not necessarily a, a sign of a healthy church on one hand, and it's not also a, a sign of an unhealthy church to have a lot, large congregation either. God can bless any congregation that he cho choose to, that is the congregation that are doing his will, he blesses them with more and more people, and then suddenly you realize that there is a large group of people. Uh, many times that there's been a revival, people have been added to the church. More and more people have come to a church when there's genuine revival that's in the church. So it, on one hand, a big congregation is not the sign of, an of a healthy church, uh, but on the other hand, it's not the sign of an unhealthy church either. There are many good and godly congregations that have grown and grown, and then all of a sudden they have a building that needs to be built because they have outgrown their facilities. So, but so, either case, it's not a healthy church nor an unhealthy church for a big congregation. Uh, how about this? Supporting many missionaries. Is that the sign of a healthy church? Well, not necessarily. How do you mean? You might be an unhealthy church that just do do what you're, you're supposed to do. You might be an unhealthy church, but yet you said, well, we, we have to give to missionaries because that's right uh, before God. And so it still is an unhealthy church that gives very little bit to, to missionaries. You might have 200 missionaries, and you might support them $1 a piece. That's not necessarily a sign of a healthy church. On the other hand, supporting many missionaries is not the sign of an unhealthy church either. There might be a church that be that will come together and, and they they really have the heart for missions and you want to see more people go out from your church, become missionaries, and more people come to your church to get support and go on the field so we have we have more and more investment on the mission field and therefore more and more uh, of God doing something in this world because of our contributions. So either way, it's not necessarily a sign of a healthy church or an unhealthy church. Supporting many missionaries, though very good, it's not a clear-cut sign that you are a, a healthy church or unhealthy. Uh, how about this? This might give me a, a little pushback. Using the King James Version doesn't make you a healthy church or an unhealthy church. What do I mean by that? If you had watched uh, Wednesday evening service, 
I had gone into great detail about why we as a congregation use the King James. And I went into detail about the, the, the text issue. I went into detail about, about the translators. I, I want to talk about uh, the different translational philosophies. And if you have any questions about that, watch that uh, service and then get back with me about that. Love to talk to you about it. But just because you use the, the King James Version doesn't make your church necessarily a healthy church. But on the other hand, if a church doesn't use the King James Version, it doesn't make it an unhealthy church automatically. What do you mean? Isn't the King James the best version? Yes. It is the best version bet on the best text with the best translational philosophy, with the ben best translators there ever were, with the best track record of producing something in this world that no other version is even close to achieving. But yeah, I can't discredit other ministries because they don't use the King James. Now, I want to say this. If your text is closer and closer to the original text, then it's a healthier church than if farther away. If you made your, your Bible that you use a paraphrase instead of a, of a actual version that is translated from the original text, you're, you're probably not a healthy church. Uh, but if you have a version that's closer to the originals, closer to the actual original text, then you will have a healthier church than unhealthy. Uh, but yeah, you can't necessarily say you have an unhealthy church because you don't use the King James Version. I've listened to many uh, preachers today that do not use the King James Version. I have gotten a lot out of their messages, and I've been really touched. But yet still, they don't use the King James. I can't necessarily say, well, you're a heretic because you don't use the King James. Some people go that route. Some people would say that if you don't use the King James, then you are indeed a heretic. Indeed, you're not even saved. If you're not saved from the King James Version, then you are not saved. Wow, that's pretty bold. That would be a, a, an example of an unhealthy church, if our church said that. We'll just say. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a healthy church because you have a big congregation. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a healthy church, that we have a healthy church in supporting many missionaries. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have a healthy church because we just use the King James Version. How about this? We don't necessarily have a healthy church because we sing hymns over other things we could be singing. Think about this. The hymns are fantastic. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we're, un that we're healthy or that we're unhealthy. It's just what we use. It's all the matter of what people do with it. You know, you can take a hymnal and you can read hymns. And if you have been saved for very long or part of uh, the church or a church that uses hymns very long, you know the hymns and you could sing it on autopilot. You really can. You could go from there and sing on autopilot, and it's really not affecting your heart, though. Your heart is not adoring God the way it should. Your heart's not loving the very fact of the doctrine that's in the hymns. Uh, you, you, you're just going through the motions. You're just going through the motions. And so you think to yourself, well, I use the hymns, therefore I have a healthy church. Well, not necessarily. Uh, and it's not a sign of an unhealthy church if you have hymns either because there are churches that could sing and praise God through their hearts and make a melody before God with the hymns that makes it very concrete, makes it very healthy if you do it properly. So what are the signs of a healthy church, you might ask me? Great question. Paul gives us qualities of a healthy church, rather a health, healthy believers in a church. You think about it, the church is not a building, the church is not an organization, but rather the church is a group of people, group of believers that have put their faith on Jesus Christ, that have come together for mutual benefit and for ministry purposes, for us to be fed to us, to be encouraged for us, uh, to be ministering one to another in what we're doing as a church. And that's what a church is. So the quality of the individual believers in a church that make up the church body will make it a healthy church or an unhealthy church. So what are the qualities 
uh, that a believer must have in order for us to be healthy believers, in order for us to have a healthy church. There are specific qualities of a healthy believer. The first quality is this. The first quality of a healthy believer so we can have a healthy church is that a healthy believer is authentic with their inward reality matching their outward action. A healthy believer is an authentic person oh, with their inward reality. The fact that they have trusted on Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior matches their outward actions. What do I mean by that? In short, if you are a Christian, if you are saved, then your outward actions should show that fact that you are saved. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a point in time in many people's lives that they strayed away from Christ. For instance, uh, one summer when I was home from college studying for the ministry, doing all the things I know I should have done, I was more in the flesh than I, I was, I was mostly carnal during that point in time, and I strayed away from, from, from God, and I even questioned the fact of whether or not there is a God, and you might say, well, what snapped you out of that? Well, I let my mind think about what it would mean in life if there was not God, if there was no such th person as God. I would say then I have no answer to how everything got here. Evolution doesn't answer any questions. It just actually uh, gives more questions than it answers because you have to make different things up in order to make it all true and scientific because science is you observing something and then reproducing something. That's science. Oh, what scientists do that believe in evolution they look backward, which that's not science. You cannot observe the creation of the universe by looking at what it is right now. Things could have changed, in which they did. If you think about the creation account. God made everything out of nothing. God supernaturally made everything, including the laws by which we're governed by, scientifically, by nature, everything he created. And so if I said that there was not a God, then I would have no answer how everything got here. I would have no answer of, number two, of the question of what is the meaning of life. I would have no, question, no answer for that question at all. Uh, I would say, well, to give myself the most pleasure there is in this world, that would be the number one meaning of life, but that's very hollow. That has no substance to it. It's like eating cotton candy. No, God is real and gives meaning to life because he created me for a specific purpose. And that gives life, my life, meaning. And so without God, there is no meaning in life. And the third thing that I thought about is that if I, there's no answer to the creation of everything, there's no answer to the meaning of life for, it, for me, uh, there's also the question about life after death. I have no idea what's coming up next in my life, let alone when I die, where would I go? And if there is no God, you have no clear-cut answer for that. Some people believe in reincarnation, that you come back as something else. How would you know? You wouldn't. You have no recollection of any life except for the life right now. You might go to some really odd, bizarre people that says, well, in your previous life, you were Alexander the Great. And you might say to yourself, is this a downgrade or an upgrade? It might be a downgrade because I'm not as rich, but it's an upgrade that I don't have to go to, to war at all. So I don't know how, what to make of that. No, reincarnation is false. Uh, why do I say that? Because when I came to the conclusion that I have no answers to all of these questions that are all about life, that I have to say, well, there is a God, and I know that the God of the Bible is the one and only God. How do I know that? The Bible is full of times where it prophesies different things will happen, and they did. Every single time the Bible prophesies about something, it came true. Uh, the, Bible, the science in the Bible is proven right. 
uh, you look at all the history of the Bible, every time they, an archaeologist goes to under, uncover something to try to prove that the Bible is wrong and therefore the God of the Bible is wrong, no, they always find what they're looking for. And so that many people that have come to try to disprove the Bible actually become believers in Christ. And so, uh, with all of this said, I have to say that when I got saved when I was 12 years old, something changed in me. Something changed in me. It changed my actions, changed my thoughts. Though I strayed away at that point in time, I knew I was still saved. I knew that God of the Bible still loved me and still had a purpose for me. With all that considered, I had to say to myself, the reason why you're feeling this way is because you have strayed away. Get right with God. And I did. And I'll tell you one thing. Everything I've done since then has not been totally fulfilling God's will for my life each and every day. No. But more and more I have, I understand that the more and more that I have a profession of faith, that I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, that inwardly everything needs to be right. Outwardly everything needs to pro proclaim that Jesus Christ is the way. So healthy believers are authentic believers with their inward reality matching their outward actions. You see that in verse number 1 through verse number 3. For I would, that's Paul speaking, that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for them as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Notice with me the word conflict. The word conflict is the same word that is used that in our English language came out the word from the Greek language, agonize. I have conflict for you. I agonize for you. Uh, if you remember from last, the, our last week's sermon, in chapter number 1, verse number 28, we see what Paul's ma manner of life was, uh, whom we preach, that's Jesus Christ, we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's his motivation in life. That's what he wants to do. He wants to tell as many people uh, about Christ as he possibly can, and those who get saved, he wants them to be discipled so that they can, too, reproduce themselves as a Christian, as a believer, so that they are perfect, meaning mature in Christ Jesus. Notice this, unto, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working. The word striving is the same word, conflict, that I agonize over you. What is the Apostle Paul agonizing over in this passage in chapter number 2? He's agonizing over the believers so that they would be mature believers, not falling for the false teaching that false teachers have given in their area. He says, I have such a conflict, I have such agonized for you who, at Colossae, for them at Laodicea, it's a, it, it's a bigger town just a little bit away from Colossae, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Everybody has not seen Paul in the flesh because he did not plant this church, the church of Colossae, but rather uh, Epaphras did, and Epaphras is, is over at Paul's saying to him all the different things that have happened with, with the believers that are in Colossae and Laodicea, as well as in Hierapolis. That's mentioned later in the book of Colossians. But he says, I so have conflict, I so agonize for you all so that you will be mature believers, not falling for any false teaching. And you notice with me in verse number two, he gives you uh, the qualities by which we need to be authentic, that the inward reality matches our outward actions. Number Verse number two, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. First of all, the first aspect that, that is seen here is that we as believers are unified together in love. The word knit together is a very interesting word. It means come together to make one whole. For instance, my body is made up of a lot of different things. Not just the outward, but also the inward. I have a skeleton, therefore my, my muscles and all that will not just fall apart. 
No, I have a skeleton that holds it together. I have muscles so the skeleton can move. I have a I have blood vessels going throughout my entire body that's being pumped by my my heart to to make sure all the blood is going everywhere. So it you know what happens if there you have no blood going to an area, well that area dies. Well, if, and I love the Bible that says uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So many applications for that. But yes, if there's an area in your body that doesn't get blood circulated to it, it dies. It needs to be amputated. And you think of the blood vessels, you think of the, the, the pulmonary uh, system, you, you think of the, uh, which is the blood, you think of the respiratory system, that which you breathe and oxygen's going into your body and then circulating to the blood and then going through the body and doing all the things that it normally should do. Uh, you have this nervous system giving signals from the brain all the way through the body for it to know what to do and where to move and how to do, how to be. Uh, you, you have the digestive system. I love the digestive system because you eat food, you taste it, and you have the taste buds on your tongue, and you're tasting, you're, you have your teeth, and so you're chewing, you're chewing, you're chewing. You swallow, and it goes down to the esophagus, and, uh, and it goes down to the stomach. The stomach uh, chews it all up with all the uh, acid that's in the stomach and make sure all the nutrients are getting dispersed from that. It goes to the other intestines. But the digestive system, very important for pe for your body to function. You have the nervous system, you have the skeletal system, you have the pulmonary system, you have the respiratory system. All these different things are working together so the body is a healthy body. And think about it, if we're going to be a healthy body, healthy church, all, our belie all the believers that are, make up the church need to be knit together. We need to become one through love. And this love is not some fuzzy feeling that you get when you're around that special someone. Ah, there's a lot of people in, at PCC when I went to school there that you could tell that they were together by just the way they looked at each other. They looked at each other and they were gazing into each other's eyes. And they couldn't, and they were talking, and every, both of them were taking in everything they said. Oh, wow. Uh, it's that fuzzy feeling of love. But once you get married, that fuzzy feeling eventually, it could fade away. You might still have it, uh, but yet a common denominator is that you love by action. You love by making a decision to put somebody else above yourself. That is love. We see that in Scripture with that the love that God has towards us. But God commended His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love that verse in Romans that talks about that, that we are enemies of God, that we were criminals before Him. We were rebels against God, doing that which did not please God, but yet God so loved us, it didn't matter what we did, because we did terrible things uh, with the freedom that we were given to sin, and we sinned, and we sinned, and we sinned, and, and God's wrath is against us, but yet God commended His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, while we were far away from Him, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were rebels and Enemies of God. God so loved us that He sent Jesus Christ into the world and died in our place so that we might have life. So that we would have redemption. So that we are now right with God and now part of His family. What a wonderful love that is. Love, John 3, 6. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, that's die and go to hell, get justice for your sins, but rather eternal, everlasting life that He gives you. What an amazing turn. We deserve hell and wrath because of our sin and our sins against God. We broke the moral law, and if God gave us justice... We would die and go straight to hell. But God had mercy on us. God gave us grace. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. What a magnificent blessing it is to be saved. 
that we in love can unify with other believers that we make the body of Christ. That we are knit together in love. That's mature believers. That's the inward. That's so inward with the outward reality. You can't love without your heart. You cannot love without deciding to love. You cannot love or you don't love if your outward reactions is not based on the inward reality. The second specific thing that is mentioned here, and notice with me, not just unified in love, but also the rest of verse number two, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Notice with me, the second specific about how we can be authentic believers, how we can have our inward reality match our outward actions, is simply this, is that we should increase in understanding and appreciation of the Word of God. We increase in our understanding and our appreciation of the Word of God. Notice with me what the text says. This is really good. And unto all, what's the word? Riches unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. That means that you as a believer know the Bible so well that you find it rich in, in understanding the great principles, the great doctrines that are in the Bible. That you find it that is worth more and more and more than what you currently have. There are all riches of the full assurance of understanding Notice with, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. What's the mystery? We talked about last time the mystery. The mystery is that God says something in the Old Testament that isn't quite understood until the New Testament. And the mystery that is found in chapter number 1 of Colossians is the fact that, that Jesus Christ not just died for the Jewish nation for them to get saved, but also for the entire world that we together with the Jews, that Gentiles with the Jews, would come together into one body called the church. That was seen a little bit here and there in the Old Testament, but really understood in the New Testament. That's the mystery of God. That God so loved me that He died for me through Jesus Christ and paid for my sin in full. That when I put my faith on Jesus Christ as my own Savior, He saves me, He redeems me, He gives me His righteousness. I am now a child of God. I am now one that he gives gifts to so that I can bless other people through the institution called the church. And because of his wonderful promises of the Old Testament to the New Testament, we know and understand more and more the riches of the book, riches of our fellowship one with another, our fellowship with God. We know more and more from here how we can have riches untold. I think of the Bible, there are many scriptures that come to mind that talks about the amazing worth of the Bible. In Psalm 19, verse number 10, it says, More to be desired are they, that's the, the words of God, than gold, yea, than much fine gold. How many of you today would like to have some, some gold bars that, that's your retirement fund. How many of you would like some gold coins and, and invest in gold and, and various things? This right here is gold. And it says, yea, then much fine gold. More to be desired of they than gold, than much fine gold. Yes, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and keeping in them there is, here's the two words, great reward. If you go to the Bible and say, this is as I learn more and more from the Bible, I learn more and more about what God wants me to do. There is great reward that comes from knowing the Bible and doing what it says. The worth of the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter number 1, it says, Whereby, whereby are given unto us, notice this, exceeding great and precious promises. Exceeding great and precious promises. And by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Notice with me what this says. It says that we are given such great 
exceeding great and precious promises in the Word of God, that through the Word of God, we might be partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? Does that mean I become a God? No. It, become, it means that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. The more and more we read it, the more and more we apply it to our lives, the more and more we just do what it says, then we are becoming more and more in the image of Jesus Christ. Also in Psalm 119, verse 105, the, the word of thy mouth is better than unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Think to yourself, if you had thousands of gold and silver, you can retire nicely right now. Now, some of you are retired, uh, knowing my congregation. A lot of you are retired. Uh, but if you were to go outside and dig up in your, in your yard, I'm not saying to do so. It might be somebody else's yard. Uh, you dig up some your, your, the yard back of your house and, and you find thousands of gold and silver pieces. This is what the psalmist says. This is better than that. Amazing what the Word of God says about itself and how much it's worth. Uh, not only that, Job 23 verse 12 says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Notice this. I have esteemed, I have accounted, the words of his mouth, the word of God, more than my necessary food. The word of God to Job says, this is greater than what I need to survive. This is what I, is greater than the food that I need to live by. This is greater. Jesus said it like this, for man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Word of God is so wonderful. It's so magnificent. We need to understand it more, but also we need to appreciate it more. How do we show that we appreciate it? We delight in it. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that delighteth in the Word of God, that delighteth in the law of God. He meditates therein day and night. He should be like a tree planted by rivers of water. And all these wonderful things that shows us that it is beneficial and exceeding great for us to get into this book. That's why we're doing the Wednesday evening uh, sermon series to be all about how to study the Bible better and get more out of it. And to feed yourself more and more with the Word of God. It's great that you like to listen uh, to me. It, it, it's fine to, to like to listen to a pastor. I have uh, numerous pastors that I like to listen to because I get a little little things here and there from what they say and understand more and more about what the Scripture says. Uh, but then here's the thing about it, is that people can be wrong. I can be wrong, but the Word of God is not wrong. Get in the Word. Appreciate God's Word more and more. Delight in it. Feast on God's precious truths, God's precious promises for us. Because of that, we will be mature believers. We'll have the inward reality become our outward actions if we study and understand God's word better and appreciate it more and more. And the second thing, though, understanding, increasing in understanding and appreciation of the word of God, it's not just the Bible it references here in Colossians, but it's Jesus Christ as well. Notice with me. In verse number two, let's just read the whole verse. That their hearts might be comforted, knit to get, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. Notice this, verse three. In whom, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hid all the treasures of of wisdom and knowledge. The word treasures there, it doesn't just mean riches or wealth. It means a storehouse. For instance, picture with me, you and I are taking a trip into a de uh, foreign land that we're doing some archaeological expeditions with. And we're looking for the great treasure that was been once told that there's that's out there somewhere. Okay, that's vague. Let's look Let's just move on. Me and my fedora, we're looking through the, the forest. Then all of a sudden, I see that there's a trap door somewhere. And I open up the door, and I go in. Light my torch. Why don't we have a flashlight? I don't know. 
I light a torch. We're looking through. And everything I see there in this storehouse, nothing but gold, nothing but silver, nothing but precious stones all around this room. And this room is so big that it stretches for miles We're and miles and miles and miles another. and miles. Full of riches. Full of the treasures that somebody left behind. And here's what it's showing us. That Jesus Christ Himself in whom are hid all the treasures, all the storehouse full of the riches that is in the Word, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Appreciate Jesus Christ. Understand His doctrine more and more. Understand His life more and more. I love the, the, the slogan that once was, what would Jesus do? WWJD. When I was saved... Uh, when I was 12 years old, that was one of the first things that was given to me. Uh, so my youth pastor at that time uh, had some trivia. Every single time the youth would meet, we would have Bible trivia. And he, whoever would prove it from the Bible that their answer was correct, they would get a special prize. Well, the first time that we did this, it was a question. And I popped right up with the, with the Bible because I just read what he had asked about. And I, and I gave him the verse and he gave me a CD, and it was what would WWJD, the CD, and in the CD case, had a bracelet of WWJD. How many of you remember that? How many remember, remember the craze of WWJD on a bracelet? Uh, the fact is, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And in fact, if you want to understand what Jesus did, or what would Jesus do in the certain circumstance that you have with you, uh, you have to understand the foundation of what did Jesus do. And so more and more you get into the book, more and more you see Jesus. Uh, one time I was asked, it was during a, a teen camp that I was a part of when I was growing up, and the speaker there was going to challenge us about how about the fact that we need to read our Bibles more. And he said, how many of you would say that you really, really know the Bible? And I was just newly saved. I had read the Bible a lot. And so I just raised my hand. And he looked at me and he said, oh, really? You know the Bible? And I'm like, well, I, I guess a little bit. You know, more than others. And he said, okay, I'll give you a question. Sum up the Old Testament for me. And I thought to myself, okay, that's a weird question. Sum up the Old Testament for you. And then the Lord just Gave me the right answer. Oh, Jesus is coming. And he said, wow, you actually do know your Bible. But more and more we look in the Bible, the more and more we see Jesus. Old Testament, we see Jesus in pictures and types and prophecies. And we actually see Jesus himself as the angel of God, the messenger of God to different people like that of Gideon, possibly Samson. Definitely with Joshua, the, the captain of the hosts of the Lord. And then we go through the, the New Testament. We see Jesus' life and amazing in the Gospels. We see the doctrine thereafter in the epistles. That we see Jesus glorified and the right Lord of Lord and King of Kings in Revelation. All the Bible speaks about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for, gra for grace to trust him more. Uh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And it's just the same as his lovely name. Jesus, oh, how I love him so. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. It's all about Jesus. How much do we understand Jesus more and more the more we get into the word? The understanding of his doctrine, understanding of his life, and how he lived is what we also should live like. Do we appreciate Jesus Christ for what he's done for us? Do we appreciate him? How do we appreciate him? We adore him. How do you appreciate your spouse? Now, don't answer me with this one. This might get you into some trouble. Uh, how often do you appreciate your spouse? Think about it. You look at your spouse and you say, I want to do something special for you. Whether it is an act of kindness, 
uh, whether it is doing the dishes, or whether it is cooking a meal, whether it is taking taking her out to eat, or whether it is, and I say her because I'm thinking of myself more and more, uh, say kind words to her and just love her the way she ought to be loved. I'm thinking of myself with my wife. You appreciate her more and more and more. You appreciate him more and more if you show it. How do we appreciate Jesus Christ? Well, we follow him. We love him. We love his word. And we do what we ought to do. A healthy believer is authentic, having their inside reality become their outward actions. Because you put your faith on Jesus Christ, you make your actions to be the same with that reality. So what we need to do today is be the authentic believers we should be. Genuine believers. People out there that need to know about Christ. They see you and what you do. It needs to be an example of what Jesus would do. How Jesus would be. To give them a track, yes, that's great. To give them a word of testimony, great, fantastic. But what you do day to day needs to example and to be like Jesus is. That Jesus saved you, you need to act like you're saved. And not just act like a, a hypocrite that you put on a face and we, we all can do that, you know. We go to church and we know what to wear. We look really good, polished up. You know, if we get to church. And we, we take our Bibles to church and, and we have the right version. And what we call the right version. And uh, we, we say hi to everybody here. And, and we, we go through the motions. We sing the songs. We memorize the songs. We know what the, the pastor preaches about. Then we get up and we move on. And when our lives on Monday are we different and if we're acting like a hypocrite if we're acting like what we shouldn't be then no no it's not going to be the same we need to be genuine Christians we need to genuinely love each other like Jesus wants us to love how will the world know that you're my disciples indeed if you have love one toward another so let us love one another let us gain and understand the riches that are in God's word and to adore Christ, which is the storehouse of all wisdom and knowledge. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to dismiss us now with your blessing. Father, help us this next week to more and more exemplify Jesus in our life. Help us to more and more glorify him in our thoughts, in our decisions in our actions, in our words that we use to help each other. Help us to, throughout this week, to gain more and more knowledge into your word, more and more appreciation for your word, and for the word, Jesus Christ. May you now dismiss us with your blessing. Bless each person that's listened. I do pray. In Jesus' name.